Thank you for joining me. This is the fifth episode, episode five of our series, Read the Bible as it was meant to be read. And we're currently working on the epistle of the Apostle Paul to Philemon. Welcome to the Bible Journeys podcast. Your traveling companion is Ed Dickerson, an author, teacher, and scholar. He holds a master's degree in religious education from Andrews University. As you explore together, you'll learn tools and techniques that illuminate scripture, renew your faith, and brighten your journey. Now, we've already been through the Epistle of Philemon once, very briefly, just just took a, took a look at it. And that's what uh, is often called, and what Mortimer Adler calls the pre-read. We'll look at that in just a moment. But there are two things that I want to make sure that are clearly understood uh, in this series of studies, in fact, through this whole podcast. Uh, and that is that the Bible is something that is meant for ordinary people. You do not have to be a scholar. There are tools that scholars have that can be helpful, but most of those are accessible these days on the Internet. So, And I will help you find some of those and show you how to use them. That's the whole point of the tools and techniques we want to illuminate Scripture. Uh, Ellen White, who wrote, a uh, devotional writer who wrote in the 19th and early 20th century, said the Bible was not written for the scholar alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. And that's obviously true as you read scripture. But though it was written for a common people uh, of uh, previous time who spoke a different language and lived in a different world. So for us uh, to understand exactly, because it was written for us, but it was written to them, to understand what it was what was written to them, we need to do some work. But that's okay, because we have the tools to do it. She also said one may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty or its deep and hidden meaning. That would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? One passage studied until its significance is clear is of more value than the perusal of many chapters, and that's exactly right. So we want to learn to read the Bible for its significance. Now, for that, I turned to something which used to be a standard book for college freshmen to read, a book by Mortimer Adler called How to Read a Book. And he talked about this concept of pre-reading, which we already did. But he says it's the difference between reading for information and understanding. When we read for information, we require facts. When we read to understand, we learn not only the facts, but their significance. And the Bible is nothing if not significant. It is not written so that we have a, a font of words and facts, but be, so that we may understand the significance of life itself and, and the trials that we go through. So we want, that's exactly what we want, is we want the significance. And we've talked about this, we've already done, so Adler talks about a pre-reading. First, and now this doesn't necessarily apply to the Bible in the sense that he says that if you want to pre-read something to find out if it's worth reading in detail. Well, the scriptures are worth reading in detail. I can tell you that, and uh, that should be obvious on the face of it. But secondly, not every bit of scripture is something that you need to read right now. It may not be something that addresses your problems right now. And there may be reasons why it is not something that that is uh, meeting, is speaking to your experience right now, and that's fine. But if you're going to read Scripture, you should read it seriously. And so we're starting with Philemon, not necessarily because it's the most important thing, although I think it has great significance for our t uh, day and, and age because of the accusations which are made against the Bible. But we want to find out exactly what's going on in this thing and, and, and how much time should we spend on it right now. So we've done that. And I have given you, as we talked about, you've got mail, look at it at, at, as though you had a, a letter. And then your return address, who wrote it? Well, we already know. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, who is it written to? Is it addressed to you? Again, I get a lot of mail. It's addressed to occupant. Uh, you know, and if uh, some of the mail that comes to my mailbox is addressed to my wife, and it's not for me, so I let her open it. 
Uh, she, she lets me open my mail. Um, but some of it is something which, which uh, you know, depending on who it came from, might, you know, the IRS, it might really affect us both, and so forth. Where was it written? Where was the person who wrote it? Did they write, is it something they wrote from their home? Did they write it on vacation? That makes a difference. Are they serving as a missionary somewhere? Are they in, in a war? They're deployed to a, a combat zone? There are lots of reasons why we want to know where something was written. And it does help us understand the mindset of the author and helps us receive what they're writing appropriately. When was it written? Sometimes mail is delayed quite a bit. Uh, sometimes it's written on someone's birthday. It might be written during a holiday season. When it was written has importance. It, it's, it also tells us something of the mindset of the original author. When was it written? So, moving on then, what did he write? The, the uh, basic ideas, and that's what the pre-reading is for. It's just to get a sense of what, what is this all about? What's going on here? And why did he write it? What, what brought this about? And to do that, of course, both what did he write and why did he write it, we have to read the thing itself. It's a, if it's a letter, we read that. If it's a larger essay, we read the whole essay and so forth. It depends on what it is. In this case, we're reading Philemon, which is a letter from Paul to Philemon. But it's not mainly about Philemon, or is it? Well, so we go through this checklist. Who wrote it? And the answer is Paul, and it says, and Timothy. So Paul and Timothy, he says, we're writing to you. Uh, and who was it written to? It was written to Philemon. Aphius, who apparently was his wife. We don't, it doesn't say that, but it seems likely. And Archippus. And Archippus means master of horse. It might mean that it's very well meant, might mean that Philemon was a very wealthy man and had stables and so forth. Certainly he had at least one slave, as we'll discover in the, uh, in the text of this. Where was it written? Well, it was written from Rome, and where Paul was a prisoner. When was it written? Well, here we only have a range of years, from AD 57 to AD 65, because after that, of course, Paul was beheaded. But the point is, there's this, we know that it's about 30, 35 years after the ascension. That's an important milestone. We also know that eight years or nine years is a pretty accurate time when you realize we're talking about something that was 2,000 years ago. Uh, that's pretty precise when you go far, that far back. Many things that happened. In the ancient past, we don't know with uh, very great specificity exactly when they happen. So, written in that fairly narrow time period. It's also, we know that Paul was in prison at least twice, two spans of time during this uh, time. What did he write? Well, there are, a lot of, there are several things in this letter, uh, but the main part of it is an appeal on the behalf of Onesimus, a runaway slave. And that's really important because slaves who ran away in ancient Rome could be killed. They could be executed by their master uh, in some pretty grisly ways. And I don't mean crucifixion. There are other ways that were pretty, pretty grotesque. And so he wants to make sure that uh, he, he wants to write on behalf of Onesimus, who's become someone he knows in Rome. And why did he write it? Because he wants to spare the man's life, at least. We want, he wants more than that. But at a minimum, because the penalty is so severe, he wants to spare the man's life. So there we have the pre-reading checklist. We have a general idea, but the significance of it and how he forms his argument and what it tells us about the Christian faith at this time, early, still, well, the second half of the first century, but very early in the history of Christianity, we need to understand the significance of what's going on here. And that significance can only be taken into account and be understood, first of all, by recognizing all these basic facts, when it was written and 
where Paul was when he wrote it, and so forth. And then we have to go into some of the details about it now. Um, because what we want to know is what is its significance. And then why did the early Christians include it in the canon? The canon of Scripture, the 66 books we have in the Scripture, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Uh, the 27 New Testament books were uh, put together by the early church because they, in their minds, these 27 works represented what one needed to know and believe in order to become a Christian. Uh, the same is true of the Old Testament, where Jews put together uh, books that they don't put them, there's 39, they divide them differently than we do, but it's the same text. And for the same reason, because they no longer had a temple where they could slaughter animals, for example, and do their sacrifices. So what, what did it mean to be a Jew when you could not practice some of the central things of your religion? And, uh, and so the canon itself is this idea of what, is, what do we need to know? What is it necessary to understand to be a Jew and then to be a Christian? Because Christians in the early first century were considered to be a sect of Judaism, and surely we see, we Christians see a continuity in the Old and New Testaments. So, and the early Christians included this very short letter in the canon. They thought, in other words, that it was important enough that, that it was necessary, it was useful, it was helpful to understand this in order to truly be a Christian. Well, so that's, that adds significance right there. Then we need to know why. What is it within this text that has that power and that capability and, and that function? And so we're going to do that. Now, there are a lot of things that we can look at in understanding when we're going to read, it, read a, a text. I have a chart here for those who are doing the video, content, uh, video podcast. Um, I'll just go through the list very quickly here. Parallelism, uh, echo and illusion, inclusios, they're called, chiasms, type scenes, names, conspicuous details, ambiguity, narratives. Uh, and then a whole series of repetition, repetition of words, of themes, of circumstances, and yes, of puns. Believe it or not, the Bible has a lot of puns in it. Now, that's an awful lot to take in. Don't worry about the list, because what we're going to do for our reading, we're not going to try and do all of this. First of all, not everything applies to every passage of Scripture. But secondly, as we're beginning, you want to take baby steps, you know, you want to just take it a little bit at a time. So what we want to do here is we want to just focus on something simple. And this is a good way to start, by the way, in any of these readings of Scripture. And then just look for words that are repeated and themes that are repeated within that work. Uh, circumstances uh, that are repeated. There's a set of circumstances showing up. So we're just going to focus on that little bit right now. Repetition of words, themes, and circumstances. And I'm going to do a little bit of your work for you before you do the pre-reading, before our next study, before you do the reading, the uh, initial reading. And that is, I'm going to tell you, believe it or not, in this epistle, there are puns. There are plays on words. And you say, how, you know, where can that be? Well, it's not obvious in English, because, of course, puns have to do with the similarity of words, similarity of meaning, similarity of sound, and so forth. And as it happens, Onesimus, the name of the slave who ran away, Onesimus means productive uh, or useful. The idea is, and this is very common, uh, you would, uh, slaves, of course, were often seen as more as uh, objects than as people. And so that's why you find names, for example, one of the uh, people who traveled with Paul was a slave named Tertius, which just means number three. And that's the kind of, oh, there's number three. Where's number three? 
not somebody you get to know. You know, that's an interesting notion of slavery, that they're somehow less than people, less than human. They're certainly less than their master in any culture. And I'm not saying that that's appropriate. I'm saying that's the way the culture views them. And so, of course, one of the ways, if you're going to say, ah, sell a slave, uh, and you want to get a good price, you can say, this one is Onesimus. This one is productive. Here's a productive slave. He's, he's worthwhile. He's got skills. He's got strengths. He's got talents. And by the way, in ancient Rome, uh, many uh, uh, slaves did have prodigious talents. Uh, and it was possible. And sometimes they set up business so their their master let them. Uh, and some of the profit would go to the master. But it was also pro- possible for them to earn enough money to buy their freedom, which did happen in ancient Rome. So Onesimus is a name that means, again, productive or useful. But Paul uses this and says, he may have been Onesimus, productive, useful, may have been useful, useless to you. He ran away. But he is useful to me. So you see where the pun comes in. He may have been useless, useless or productive, may have been useless, but now he's useful. And he can be useful to you too. And so there's a pun. Again, this happens a lot uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Scripture. They, especially in Paul, especially, but even the Old Testament, many of the Old Testament writers like to use words uh, that uh, they like to use a play on words because it's something you remember. And so that's what is happening here. We've already said that one may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty or its been hidden meaning. One passage studied until its significance is clear is of more value than the perusal of many chapters. That's Ellen White, again, the 19th and early 20th century writer. Mortimer Adler who uh, wrote most of the 20th century. I don't, I don't know if he lived quite in the 21st century. He lived well into his 90s. He said, anyone who undertakes anything knows that the achievement seldom exceeds the effort. In other words, you get out of something what you put into it. And if you want to get a lot out of Bible study, then you need to put more into it. And then he says, why should it not take time and trouble to learn to read and to read what is worth reading? This is perfect sense. If the Bible is as important as we believe it to be, then it's going to take some time and some effort to learn to read it as it was meant to be read. But it'll be worth it in the long run. It's worth reading. And that's so important. And, you know, it's nice to get the facts but and, and read uh, rapidly, but we don't always get very much out of it. See, as Lewis says, as soon as they can read for themselves, there are those who read only when there is nothing better to do. Gobble up each story to find out what happened and seldom go back to it. Others who reread and are profoundly moved. That is the whole thing, rereading and profoundly moved. So yes, if we're going to really understand the Bible, if we're going to read the Bible as it was meant to be read, it's going to take more than one reading. But it will be worth it. Now, again, I want you to go through in the, before the next time, before our next pod, podcast, I want you to go through uh, the epistle to Philemon and look for words that are repeated. There, there are a couple of words, uh, several words, actually, which are repeated multiple times. And we're talking about 25 verses. And I can think of a couple of different words that have five occurrences in 25 verses. That's a lot. There are themes that are repeated. They may not use exactly the same word, but they're talking about the same type of thing. And those themes are repeated. 
And finally, there may be circumstances. The repetition, because repetition is one of the chief means in which the biblical writers uh, emphasize what's important to them. And this is especially important in, uh, in the Old Testament. We're reading uh, this epistle is in the New Testament, of course. But in the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament Hebrew only has a very few words in it, uh, several thousand. It's all the vocabulary. And so in order to uh, increase emphasis, to make sure the reader doesn't miss something, things are often repeated. But that happens in English, too. We repeat the things that we want to be remembered. And so looking for repetition is one of the very first things you do, seeing that, oh, here comes this word again. Why is he using this word in this place? Uh, why would he use this word when another word would work? Uh, what, what's going on here? Uh, themes, is he bringing up the same ideas again, even though he may describe them differently? Because that makes a difference as well. So words, themes, circumstances, all of those things uh, look for repetition and uh, and cite, you know, just may take a little note. Here it is in verse uh, 5. Here it is in verse 17. Whatever it is, write down. So here it is, and then compare them. Look at one after the other and say, hmm, what is he, what is he doing in all of these cases? Or is he doing something similar? Is he doing something different? Is he comparing them? Is he contrasting them? That's a that's an enormous tool that we can use to compare and contrast things. Uh, and so do that, just this little, it's not a lot of work because it's not a lot of, not a lot of verses. But, you know, 25 minutes, uh, half an hour, uh, 45 minutes, uh, whatever you want to put into it, it'll be worth it, believe it or not. But whatever time you have, put that time in this, in before the next podcast. And let's see what we come up with. Now, I want to repeat what Mortimer Adler said, because this is all about the process, again, of learning to read the Scripture as it was meant to be read. And I'm repeating what he said earlier. While you're in the stage of learning to read, oh, by the way, this is repetition. <laughs> I'm doing it for emphasis, just like the Scriptures do. While you're in the stage of learning to read, you have to go over a book more than once. If it is worth reading at all, it is worth three readings at least. And again, this may sound like a daunting task, but the first one, that pre-reading, didn't take any time at all. The second time through, as we begin to look for some of the things that I listed earlier, takes a little bit longer. And the third time can be, uh, in between the two, it depends, as you're comparing and contrasting and showing how these things form patterns within the text. However, and this is the great thing. I've talked about this when we talk about when you learn to drive a stick shift, for example, manual transmission. You learn to drive that manual transmission, and when you're first doing it, it's like, oh, man, I don't know if I can ever get this. Let the clutch out, take my foot off the brake, put my foot on the accelerator, ease the clutch out. It's all got to be, all these things have to take place coordinated very smoothly. Otherwise, you lurch around. I did when I first started driving manual transmission. But then after you get used to it, once you get good at it, you don't even think about it. You can drive in traffic with a stick and just go around. It's worth three readings at least, he says. Let me hasten to say that the expert reader can do these three readings at the same time, just like you get used to doing the manual transmission and you can do all of these things at the same time. So. The more we get it, we're starting with a small book, and we're starting with small things. But as you go through this, if you'll stick with me, you'll find that it gets easier and easier and amazing insights. I have study groups I've worked with over the years, and once, they, once you begin to catch on, it becomes an exciting, shared experience as we discover together treasures that not one, none of us could discover all alone. One of the great things about Bible study in a group. So, again, 
for the before the next podcast, go through and look for repetition of words, of themes, and of circumstances. All right. I just want to say if you have any comments or any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is BibleJourneys at Yahoo.com. You can reach me there with comments or uh, questions. If you're seeing the video version of this podcast, then you can do it in the comments section. I welcome questions. The greatest learning takes place when people ask questions that I can then answer. We can go and explore together. Oftentimes, uh, you'll see things in Scripture that I have not seen myself. And again, we all benefit from that. So I welcome those. As long as we keep it uh, civil and so forth, it's just a great thing to do. And I welcome that. And so until next time, I hope that uh, you will enjoy your Bible journey. If you've gained something from this discussion, please be sure to share it with someone, because those who join our Bible journeys here can become our traveling companions for eternity. Unless otherwise indicated, all scripture quotations are from the New American Standard Bible. This episode is one of a series entitled, Read the Bible as It Was Meant to be Read. To gain the most from these episodes, I suggest that you listen to them in order. It will ease your study and answer many of the questions that might otherwise arise. I welcome serious questions and comments and hope to incorporate them into future episodes. If you would like to comment or ask a question, the best way to contact me for any purpose is at my email, biblejourneys at yahoo.com. Please put podcast and the episode number in the subject line. This podcast is copyright 2023 by Ed Dickerson.